What's up, everybody? I'm so excited to be here. I'm Ulysses Owens Jr. And this is the drummer's perspective, or I should say from the drummer's perspective. And I'm here with Open Studio Network, and I'm just so excited uh, to premiere this new series that we came up with. Um, I've been a huge uh, fan of Open Studio Network for a while. I'm fortunate to have two courses with them. One is called Finding Your Beat, which really explores probably about four hours of uh, cool drum material. The other is with my absolute brother, and that's the great Ruben Rogers. And we have a course called The Art of Swing. And so as a result of these different collaborations, we decided to come together and form this weekly series. And when uh, they approached me, I said, man, there's a lot of people that I want to interview. But the first I have to interview is the maestro, because I, I have to say he is probably the first person and and the main person that led to a lot of what my career has become and that he has been my north star and that is the great lewis nash so before i bring mr nash in i'm gonna uh let you hear a little bit of a track that just inspires me it's from the cyrus chestnut record called soul food so uh check this out for a quick second up Juan I see you what's up Richie So that was uh, Sir Nash, and uh, I have to tell you, Louis Nash is the reason that I moved to New York for many different uh, qualities that he possesses. One is he's an incredible human being. Two, he is and obviously the reason why all of us are here, he's a wonderful drummer. And three, he is a person that everybody loves. You know, when I moved to New York City back in 2001, which we're going to talk about shortly with Louis, um, I heard a couple different names that that were always resounding uh, in terms of everybody's favorite musician and Lewis was at the top of the list. He was everybody's favorite musician to record with and also to play live with, which is a challenge because you have a lot of people who are great in either discipline, but to have one that people love to record. They love to play live and they love to tour with him. He literally was the guy that no one could ever say enough good things about. And then obviously a consummate professional. And uh, I got exposed to his playing uh, through a wonderful record. But I'm going to talk about all that when I get him on here. So I just want to let you all know how much this means to me to have Lewis Nash here. Uh, he is what I love to affectionately call the maestro. He was my teacher and still I consider him a teacher and a friend. So everybody, can you please put your, your internet snaps and applauses together and welcome the great lewis nash hey you what's up sir good to be with you <laughs> all right man i am i'm so excited to have you here it's my um, pleasure man and i, I just want to kind of go ahead and, and dive in lewis you know i first got exposed to you i don't know how because the internet wasn't really happening then but it was through like a new york times article that talked about the most in-demand jazz musicians and i feel like nate chenin might have wrote it and it featured you and Mulger and Christian. And so I just want to kind of jump out the gate and just ask you, like, what is it like being one of the most in demand drummers, uh, I, obviously in jazz, but really across uh, many different genres, but for several decades? Like, what does that feel like for you? It feels busy. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know, the thing is, when, when you are busy, first of all, thank you for your beautiful introduction. I really appreciate that. And um, for everyone out there, that, that's correct. You know, we first met when Ulysses was a student mm -hmm. at Juilliard back in 2001. So um, to get to your, back to your question, though, um, I think you, you simply accept and, and uh, work with, you know, the, the things that are going on in your career. So for me, uh, I kept getting calls to work with a variety of different people. I had long-term relationships as well um, over the course of my career. Some, you know, some of them were a number of years, 
And so when you have all of this variety of things going on, you simply um, make sure that you're up for the task, first of all, that you, you're prepared. And then in a way, you almost don't have time to think about what you asked me. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. you're, you're so busy making sure that you're dotting all the I's and crossing all mm-hmm. the T's that reflecting on what, what does this all mean sometimes mm-hmm. just comes later, actually. Mm-hmm. Great. No, that's amazing, man. I also want to talk just a little bit about your upbringing. So I know you're from uh, Arizona and and Phoenix, and maybe just a little bit about how you came to the drums, how you got exposed to the drum set, and then and also specifically maybe jazz. So just enlighten us a little bit on that journey. Okay. Well, yes, Phoenix, Arizona is my hometown. That's where I'm at right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I still have a presence in New York City, of course. Yes, and, yes. And I'm, before the pandemic, I was there uh, at least once a month to do something, a recording, a gig or something. And so I, I imagine that that will resume in due time. <laughs> but uh, speaking of Phoenix, Phoenix Suns are in the Western oh, yeah. Conference playoffs. <laughs> now, you know, I go back to the, the, the um, I know that we're not talking about basketball, but I go back to the expansion days of the Phoenix Suns when they first came on the scene as a brand new team in the NBA. Mm. And so I, I have a long standing, you know, kind of, uh, you know, support uh, for the Suns. I'm glad to see them, you know, making it into the to the finals of the nice. Western Conference. Go if Suns. they get if they get to the finals, uh, that's going to be deep. But uh, yeah. anyway, <laughs> cool. so anyway, uh, you know, and again, it's it's hot here. We are in triple mm. digit temperatures wow. right now here in Phoenix already. 114. They're expecting 115 maybe wow. today. Wow. But anyway, this is where I grew up. In the in the desert, um, I'm kind of a middle child, so to speak. I have uh, five siblings. There's six of us, and so I have three older sisters. Then there's me. Then I have a younger sister and younger and baby brother. Mm-hmm. And uh, as far as music goes, around my house, I heard all kinds of uh, music that you would expect maybe in 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 such an environment. I heard uh, the R and B hits of the day, of course, all the soul music of the 60s and and uh 70s and 80s of course all the motown stuff and all that and um of course everything that was on the radio on am radio i didn't grow up in a house where uh there was any jazz played to any extent really um i heard a a lot of gospel and spiritual music Mm. and was in church all the time of course and i heard the blues my mother was Mm. a big blues fan you know she liked um you know, B.B. King, Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, Lightning Hopkins, all that kind of stuff. So that was my the musical environment that I grew up in. And it just so happened that I'm the only member of the family that actually pursued uh, music. So I'm the only musician in the family. Wow. So, wow. yeah, and I was about 10 years old when I got my first drum set. Wow. Apparently, I showed interest before that as a younger child mm-hmm. going under the cupboards in the kitchen and getting pots and pans and and uh knives and spoons and <laughs> all yeah. that kind of stuff yeah. um so that's kind of how i got started that's the earliest uh, mm. you know manifestation of any kind of musical <laughs> yeah. uh, interest did you ha- did you have lewis any um kind of classical exposure because you know one of the things that sticks out to me about your playing from day one because i had that that chance is is your articulation and you know you have you know you hear about jazz drummers sort of not being ones that are into technique, but I feel like you're one of the most technical jazz drummers, particularly in your generation, even like a Max Roach. So was that exposed via like whether it was marching or classical or symphonic band, you know? Well, uh, to be totally honest, I I didn't have any uh, formal training in terms of just drums directly wow. from a teacher privately. Um, until uh, much later in my life, I was in my twenties actually. So, wow. so for me, the my my um, knowledge of how to do what I did on the drums came from elementary music school teachers, who m- most of, they weren't drummers, but they they taught me what they knew about wow. the the basics of of uh, you know snare drum uh, material for elementary school kids, mm-hmm. I guess you would call it. Mm-hmm. So. I played in what would have been considered an elementary school, you know, uh, 
the school band where we're learning basic, very basic things, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. for the snare drum and bass drum, et cetera. And we marched a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then when I got to high school, I continued in the what was called the concert band. So I'm mm -hmm. reading, you know, basically, I guess you would call that basic concert band material. Mm -hmm. Get these headphones on straight. <laughs> and um, but anyway, um, I didn't have early symphonic training, if that's the, the question you're yeah. asking. Um, but I think um, just looking at the way I was as a kid and the way my and inclinations and tendencies were and the way my brain worked, I guess mm -hmm. you would say, mm -hmm. I like clarity. Yeah. And so it, I think it was a natural inclination, not to say that I didn't work. I, I spent a lot of time practicing, but mm -hmm. um, I like to be able to hear with, with real clarity what, what I was playing. And and this is this probably goes back to before I even knew anything about the drum set or playing jazz. Just if I was going to play the drums, I wanted it to be clear. And wow. so I was paying attention to the stuff I was hearing and picking right. it apart. So right. I was what I was hearing was James Brown's drummers. Yeah. You know, I was hearing uh, the meters. Yeah. I was hearing the, the all the R&B hits. And I'm mm -hmm. trying to figure out. I don't know anything about stickings and what they, yeah. and I'm, I'm trying to figure out in my own way what they were doing. Yeah. You know, so that's kind of, you know, I didn't to answer your question more specifically. No, I did not have any uh, yeah. classical training early on. Well, yeah, because I, I remember like when I was studying with you, I remember you, you know, you have a lot of different drum teachers who, particularly for jazz, they come in with like all the sort of usual suspect books, right? Like the Wilcoxon, you know, Ted Reed syncopation. And I remember like you didn't come to me with that, which I was excited about. But we talked a lot about records and mm -hmm. you talked about just like it was like your approach. It, it felt very organic. You know, I mm. felt it was very much like hey, you instead of me giving you a page out of a book, come watch me at a studio session and watch the clarity on my kid and so i was just curious like was there ever a book or was there ever like an exercise or you know three rudiments that you would say hey learning or practicing these things is what kind of sort of helped me with technique until obviously the other you right. know until you start getting gigs and stuff was there like some specific things that you practiced early on I i'll try to put it in the right words mm -hmm. Because I didn't have a teacher early on mm. from from like, you know, my earliest days of playing the drums and I was self-taught then mm -hmm. trying to figure things out. I didn't get um, I didn't establish early on what it means to um, practice certain things mm. and, and work on certain things. You know, okay. I, I didn't I didn't have that guidance from a teacher and know wow. about doing that. So um, I guess what I'll say is I think that's extremely valuable. I mm. think I'm extremely lucky that I that <laughs> even though I didn't have that, I was still able to become a part of this. Yeah. Um, and so and, and I often reflect Ulysses on the fact that I didn't know a lot um, early on. And and it's I say that not to brag. What is that to brag? That's nothing to brag about. Mm -hmm. But what I'm what I'm saying is um, I'm always uh, trying to stay aware of possibilities um, outside of the norm. So, for example, maybe perhaps if I if I were coming along right now in 2021, mm -hmm. knowing the little bit that I knew back then when I first came on i probably wouldn't get into any of these jazz programs <laughs> no, they hear that, please so they hear that rod symbol beat and I, you know <laughs> what i feel i feel the same way i feel like i wouldn't get into juilliard now you know the, the way that things <laughs> you know to your point the way that they're demanding a lot of information right for you right. to know before you even walk in the door right you know? and i don't you know that's that's what it is i think mm -hmm. standards should be high and i'm not mm -hmm. arguing about that but i'm just saying i have an awareness of right the fact that i you know, there are many talented maybe musicians who perhaps um, don't have a lot of uh, knowledge about the history or mm -hmm. the great players on their instrument or even, mm -hmm. you know, and and those people um, run the risk of being left out of this whole thing if we only look at things one way. Right, that, right, that, right, that's right, all right. I, that's all I'm saying. No, I, I agree. Know. And it's, it's so interesting to me to hear this journey that you've had because you and I've never actually talked about this, but mm -hmm. your playing is so sound and it's so technically uh, on point um, that that's very interesting to hear sort of your earlier career. So I, I want to talk maybe about 
you, you said maybe when you were about 20, you started then getting access to a teacher. Can you maybe tell me just a few things you learned um, before we kind of get into obviously the fruits of your labor and this incredible career you continue to have, but what were some of the things that you were introduced to in those, those lessons? Well, the, the very first drum teacher that I had uh, here in Arizona was a was a guy a, a gentleman who taught at ASU at the time his name was Mark Sunkett mm. and Mark Sunkett played mostly he was a, a very established as a classical musician he played drum set of course and, mm. and could play very well but he was a mallet player and and symphonic percussion kind of specialist now later he's he's passed on now but later on in his life he became very involved in African drumming and actually mm. made some trips to Africa and uh, mm -hmm. studying djembe and other other mm -hmm. hand drumming techniques, but at that time he was he was uh, he had just um, gotten on the faculty at Arizona State at that time. We're mm -hmm. talking about the mid seventies now. Mm -hmm. Seventy six was my freshman year, and um, so that interaction with him kind of was my first opportunity to see what a one on one drum set teacher student relationship was even like i wow. had no idea wow and so he taught he would and at that time i have to say this you know my freshman year of college um i had no clue about uh many of the great players or the the uh chronology of the development of the wow. music or any of that so if you would have said um who was max roach who was art blakey who was philly joe jones who is uh Elvin Jones, who was Tony Williams, who was Art Taylor. I would have been sitting there like a deer in headlights. Like, <laughs> I don't know. And wow. I really didn't know. Wow. But see, what I think, and I'll get back to your question, and mm -hmm. I don't mean to belabor the answer, but um, the fact that I didn't know a lot and, and hadn't kind of latched on to concrete ideas about how something should go or how mm -hmm. something is supposed to sound made me more open to to just hear things and say oh i like that or i, I don't like that and it doesn't even matter if i like what what is that if right. i like it or don't like it i just was open to the things i was hearing and new new things about because up to that point i was playing a lot of r&b and funk yeah yeah you know, i was playing in uh for for high school and college dances mm -hmm. in in a band around around here in phoenix it was the, the last band i was in like that was called spice <laughs> and I was and I was playing the drums and I was you know I was singing Easy and Brick House from the oh, Commodores, yeah, Nash. <laughs> you know. We so, need to get you to boom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I had. So that's what I was doing, you know. And mm -hmm. um, but in high school, I did start to play uh, some jazz. I played in what was called the stage band in mm -hmm. those days. Okay. And then I also joined. I was um, um, asked to join an all star high school group which was called the young sounds of arizona ah. which, which still exists now but but even though i was a part of that all-star high school jazz band and we played i remember we played some charts because I'd, I'd begun to read drum set charts at that time mm -hmm. um uh, my high school band director uh was very you know instrumental in getting me to understand what what are these slashes and mm -hmm. <laughs> these repeats and this what does a drum chart look like Mm -hmm. So I started that already. So I had that familiarity and I could read and I could count. And I had mm -hmm. decent time. So I just didn't know any history or any language. OK, really. All I knew is ding, ding, da, ding. Yeah. <laughs> and you you do some stuff with your other hands and feet yeah. that fit with it. But I, I didn't really know what I was doing. OK. All through that. OK. And so I guess what that says is perhaps maybe I had some kind of natural inclination yeah. for doing it, even yeah. though I didn't know any details so okay. when i got to college you know i met with mr sunkett as i mentioned and then i had an upperclassman who was whose combo i was assigned to because mm. i wasn't a music major i was a broadcast journalism major wow i wanted to at that time the mid 70s there was a, a broadcaster abc news had the first uh, african-american anchor named max robinson mm. uh, and so I saw that I was on that trajectory. That's what I wanted to do, wow. you know, be like Walter Cronkite and those guys. So <laughs> um, that's what that was what I enrolled at ASU as a broadcast major. But I took electives in the music department and I I had uh, classes uh, uh, in the jazz studies department. And I was also in a combo that was run by a, a, a guy who's still a good friend of mine named Alan Chase. Mm -hmm. 
who teaches at Berkeley, he was at New England Conservatory for a while. I think he's a dean now at Berkeley. Mm-hmm. Mm. But anyway, he had a combo, and uh, I was this freshman drummer, new drummer, and he said, we're going to play the music of Miles Davis. And I guess the look on my face must have given it away. And he wow. looked at me and he said, uh, you know who, you know who Miles Davis is, don't you? <laughs> and I must have said something like, I, I've heard of him or mm-hmm. something, something of that nature. So it's, that's pretty late. Mm-hmm. But, but he was very um, um, proactive. He worked at mm-hmm. a record store. He said, mm-hmm. come by this store and I'm going to, you know, you need wow. to know some of these people. And then he says, uh, you know, Philly Joe Jones is no. He wow. named all the drummers who played with Miles, wow. Jimmy Cobb, Tony, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I didn't know anyone. Wow. So since we were going to be doing the music of Miles Davis, he, he, he started talking about Philly Joe. Mm-hmm. And actually, the first record I bought was uh, with my own money was uh, the first real jazz record I bought with my own money was Blue Train. That he sold me Blue Star Train. Wow. <laughs> and he was talking yeah. about Philly Joe. So I said, okay. And he, I said, okay, so we're playing Miles Davis's music. And I went back again. I said, what, what, what can I buy with, with this Philly Joe Jones guy <laughs> mm. on it? So I bought Milestones and Round, Mid, Round About Midnight. And that wow. kind of started me. And which is, and again, I'm a freshman in college and I'm just trying to catch up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But I started reading a lot of biographies of jazz musicians, mm-hmm. asking the, uh, the older, jazz musicians who were around Phoenix at that time, a lot of questions and going and sitting and talk with them and recording, borrowing LPs yeah. and taking them home, stacks of LPs and recording them onto cassette tapes, taking them back and getting some more. So there were a wow. couple of guys who were really you know, instrumental in that. One, one of them is still here now, it's a pianist named Charles Lewis. Wow. Um, so, you know, so that, that, you know, that was yeah. kind of that early period where I didn't really know anything and I had to really catch up to learn so, stuff. See, man, I, I love that because that was a very similar journey for me. You know, I, I started playing drums in church and then I got exposed to a Miles Davis record like you milestones at 16. And then same, I started having a lot of drummers in Jacksonville or, or not even drummers, but musicians sort of exposed me to music. And then, like you said, when I got to New York, I still didn't know a lot of people's music. But just that, you know, going to record shops and just bringing them, you know, sort of receiving the music in an organic way, I think is mm-hmm. key. And uh, so it's really interesting to see um, your journey with that. And it's funny, I, I find that a lot of drummers now or just musicians, they kind of want to be kind of spoon fed in some ways. But I think you cannot, <laughs> you cannot take away just that ability to go to the record shop or or go on Spotify or whatever your method is and just digest this music. So I'm glad yeah. you I'm yeah. glad you mentioned that. I, I wanted to kind of shift a little bit because I, I know we have a lot of questions, but I wanted to shift kind of now more to your career and mm-hmm. kind of ask two key t- two key questions. One is, what was sort of that first gig that either got you to New York and or what was that kind of like exodus of leaving Arizona and then getting to the place like New York that is really where your it seems like where your ascension happened uh and you are the 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 reason why we're talking to you today so what's what was that journey well not long after that um my first lessons with uh mr mark sunkett at asu um during those years in the mid 70s again we're talking about um billy taylor's trio came to phoenix Mm. and in that trio was a drummer named freddie waits frederick waits wow and so um, I heard them play, was really taken by what he was doing on the drum set at that time. I introduced myself. We established a relationship, a rapport. And uh, he was in town for several days. They were doing things. So I kind of just shadowed him, <laughs> followed him around, <laughs> asking stuff. And then he agreed to, he said, if I could get to New York, that he would, he would teach me. So the summer of 1979 is when I went to New York for the first time having never, never been there. So I was kind of shell shocked being from the uh, Phoenix and never having really been anywhere else. Um, but uh, Freddie was kind of my, you know, uh, the way that I got familiar with New York for the first time, he introduced me to a lot of people, introduced, introduced me to Max Roach, he introduced me to Billy Hart, mm. introduced me to a number of people. Mm. And just studying with him that summer and then while in New York, having a chance to go to the Vanguard and hear Elvin sitting on the front row and Whoa. just sit right in front of his drums, going to hear Art Blakey, going to hear whoever was on the scene playing around New York in, in that time. You know, so I heard so many great musicians and that really um, convinced me that I needed to move there. 
<laughs> you know. And so wow. I came back to Phoenix. And again, Freddie Waits um, is the person who recommended me to Betty Carter, who's the person who called me to to uh, audition for her. Wow. wow. On the basis of Freddie's recommendation, Betty, you know, asked me. Of course, I had to still play for her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, she could, right. She could veto it at any time. But right. um, so I, I went to New York in 19. It was 1981 by the time. Mm -hmm. Freddie had recommended me to her and I went to New York for the first time uh, for the second time uh, Betty was there at the airport we went directly to her house from the airport I set up my drums and we started rehearsing and after a little while she said okay kid she called me kid for the whole time I was with her pretty much. <laughs> okay kid you, you got the gig and our, our first gig is next next week at Blues Alley do you have a passport of course no you know, well, you better get one because we're going to Europe in the, this summer. So it was a whirlwind, but and uh, so it hasn't stopped since then. Actually, only the the pandemic brought it to us. <laughs> right. So, so <laughs> man, you 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 mentioned a lot of really key things and dropped some gems, and I just want to kind of uh, kind of go backwards a little bit. So you you get to Betty Carter, but my question is to to kind of go a little bit more micro. Okay. How do you get? How do you have your ride symbol beat together enough? Because you know, you and I both. Uh, you spent a lot of time with Mulgrew and, you know, Mulgrew mentored me and he talked a lot about you and how he said, first of all, you're amazing. But he said one of the keys to why you are who you are and why everybody loves you is because of your ride symbol beat and then obviously your musicianship. So how do you go from, you know, you're in Arizona, you have this interesting <laughs> journey to you got your your ride symbol beat together. You know, how do you know how to, to groove and then playing with a singer? So like. And then, and then the, one of the greatest singers ever that lived, <laughs> like, how do you, well, <laughs> like, what did you have together or what did you have to activate to be able to, to get in that seat? Cause there's a lot of people I'm sure that got that call and got sent back home. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how many or whatever. And I know that, <laughs> right. that was a very desirable gig right. at that time. Yeah. So I know how fortunate I was. Um, there's a few things I'll say. I, um, again, I'm very, uh, a stickler about clarity. So once I found out who the great players were and I, and from talking to people who the guys who really had this together, you know, mm -hmm. Billy, Philly, Joe, Kenny Clark, mm -hmm. Jimmy Cobb, you know, uh, all of the, the great ride symbol feels, I just started putting on records and playing along with them. Yeah. And sometimes I would pretend, like I tell people all the time, I joke, I told Mr. Cobb too, I said, I used to pretend I was Jimmy Cobb. I, I put on my <laughs> headphones and have the Miles Davis records going. Yeah. And then I was like, yeah, I'm Jimmy Cobb. You know, <laughs> you know um, but I would, I would emulate a lot of, a wow. lot of that stuff. You know, that's basically what I would do. So, so that was really your foundation for, for emulating. Knowing. It was yeah. emulating. No, yeah. that's because that's, I, I really didn't have the teacher. And, and again, my teacher wasn't, a, you know, he wasn't someone who was out here playing jazz gigs all the time. Right. So, right. So for me, um, I the best thing for me to do was try to play what I was hearing. Yeah. And so I would put, you know, the uh, like um, Blue and Boogie and, you know, those mm. miles with Kenny Clark, miles yeah. with Philly Joe, miles with Jimmy Cobb, yep. miles with everybody <laughs> yeah you know? no that, that, i know? agree yeah i did the same thing i had a couple of specific questions uh with that what do you feel are like three keys to really uh helping you to be a better drummer so we, we talked about obviously emulating but mm. you know for drummers out there like i'm getting messages from so many different drummers who quite frankly have so much to check out right they've got all right. the stuff that you're you're talking about but then they've got your legacy and your generation then now they've got my generation and then the generation after so what are maybe three things you talked about emulation um what are maybe three other things in addition to emulation and clarity that that a drummer could literally take today and go to the practice room with those qualities and 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 make and t and get on that journey of getting better hmm. hmm let me just give a little thought to that sure so one thing that comes to mind right away is the ability to put yourself firmly in the the present moment that you're in wow. and respond and react to the musical stimuli that you're getting in that moment so that means many of the things that you may have worked on already in your practice um some things may be applicable but this isn't a plug and play type situation 
Mm -hmm. So you have to really be tuned in to what's going on in the specific moment that you're mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Betty always said to me uh, when I was working with her was she, she wanted me to be, she didn't want me to be habitual and just mm. play the same things over and over again on a particular arrangement or a particular tune. So even if an arrangement is a set arrangement, she, if I played the same fill leading into the solos or leading into her book, she would say something. I already heard that kid play something else. Find something else. I heard you play that already, kid. Wow. You know, all, all the time, constantly. Wow. So what that did for me was put me in the mindset of always looking for, even if it's just a slight variance on something, just so that you don't get habitual and say, oh, this is what I do on this tune. This is what I do right here mm -hmm. on this tune mm -hmm. or whatever. You always are looking for a slightly different uh, uh, take mm -hmm. um, on the little intricate things that you do even. So wow. that would be something I think to take away. That's something that stayed with me all this time that, okay. I, you know, as she said. No. Um, no, the other thing I, I was going to say is the listening part. You know, you talked about listening to recordings, mm -hmm. but when you're when you're on the stage, it's a it's a different kind of listening in the sense that you're you're um, you know, since you're actively involved, you know, one thing is listening when you're just listening to a recording and you're not playing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you're listening when you're playing, um, then all the things that you practiced, you know, come into play in terms of timing, uh, level of dynamics, volume, etc. You could play the same fill at pianissimo that you play at mezzo forte or at forte, and it has a different effect on the band. And you have to know what kind of those um, sonic choices that you make, uh, mm -hmm. how they affect the music. So that's another thing. Knowing if I play this fill or this hit or this figure or mm -hmm. this phrase at this volume level or on these parts of the drum set rather than mm -hmm. these parts of the drum set, how does that affect the music? Th that's the kind of stuff I'm talking wow. about. I love it. So I'm going to just call a bunch of names of, of people, obviously, you played with and uh, and just and, and just get you to drop some more of those gems as well as also studio. So obviously, you know, Tommy Flanagan, you know, Branford Marcellus, uh, Cyrus Chestnut, you know, uh, Nancy Wilson and the list goes on and on. All the great producers, you know, uh, what are what are some gems and things that you want us to think about uh, as a drummer to switch those gears? Because I know when you're going from, you know, a Nancy Wilson record to then playing at the Vanguard with Joe Lovano and then going from Joe Lovano to going to Birdland and playing with, you know, whomever you know whether it's Col robbie coltrane or playing yeah. with you know regina carter like what tell me a little bit about you know as we get into more of the career kind of mindset tell me about how you had to shift your brain a little bit to accommodate all of these different artists in the way that all of them want you and you're all their favorite guys because i remember getting like mm. at a certain point i started getting called a sub for you and it was like everybody i got called to play with you like were their number one guy and then and then everybody else got the call. So like, what was it that you continue to do to shift your gears to be that drummer that can I mean, to be on Winton's record, then a Joe Lovano record, then a big band record or, you know, Dizzy Gillespie All Stars, then, a you know, Dinah Crawl record. I mean, those are so many different things. So can you maybe just talk about that in whatever way, you know? Yeah. OK. Um, your versatility, basically. I'm very I again, I feel so fortunate and privileged to have had the opportunity to play with all these different people. And I think you, when you bring to each situation a certain type of preparation, hmm. see, see preparation can lead, even if, you're, even if you're, um, your confidence level is not where you might actually want it to be about a particular project or whatever, or about doing a certain thing. You know, we all get butterflies and we're all, you know, want to make sure that we give people what they want so even if you might have a few uh nervous butterflies about a certain thing if you're prepared you're less apt to be caught up in all of these uh mental gymnastics about mm, the thing mm -hmm. so even if you don't understand number one you don't have to understand everything clearly you don't have to mm. know everything someone wants just prepare yourself <laughs> if wow. there's if there are charts available and you ha don't have a chance to rehearse Take a look at them, put them under a microscope, see what's happening in this section, what's happening, what are the hits. Um, if there's a recorded version that you can listen to, 
listen to it. That doesn't mean you're they that you're supposed to play what the drums play on there, or maybe that version doesn't even have drums, and mm. maybe it's a <laughs> MIDI thing. Mm. Do as much preliminary preparing as is possible, mm. and in a way, it's kind of a that's kind of mindset that an athlete would have, or an actor or an actress would have. When you talk about all the various different types of music and players and, and, and musical visions that I've been a part of, they're not all the same, mm -hmm. but they're all music. And I um, take seriously, um, you know, m my job, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, what I do. And so mm -hmm. if someone is, is uh, um, taking the, the chance on, on having me, I shouldn't say taking a chance. If someone uh, it hires me to do something with them, I'm assuming right away that they have probably heard what it is that I do and have an, some idea of it. And so you don't want to disappoint and you don't want to um, be unprepared. So again, as much of, of the little detail type preliminary things you can do prior to the actual engagement with the people, mm -hmm. the better, the better. And then so that's specific to that person. Right. Now, not, what's not specific to that person or the, who, whatever the situation is, is your general preparedness. Right. You know, right. are you, um, you know, is, is your equipment in good condition? Right. You know, do you have, you know, you got the right uh, sticks and brushes and things that are required for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, wow. have you have you been practicing just in a general sense? Is your is your physiology and musculature in, mm -hmm. in shape? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Are you able is your endurance? Are you able to? do this in terms mm -hmm. of that so that that's a lot of stuff that probably uh, that that's non-musical per mm -hmm. se maybe but those are all things that are important parts of this what's this. some what's some of the best advice you got uh because you talked about betty uh which was really key uh not wanting you to be habitual what was some great advice you may have gotten in the studio whether it was either from an artist or a producer or even you know because i, I love your sound in the studio one you have such an incredible articulation um no matter the engineer your drums are always clear you're always musical and again you fit into every record it's like and, and then when you start getting into the orchestration you know i'm like how can anybody else think to play anything else than what nash played you know it's, it's hard like i hate having to go after you because i know i can't do what you do so but specifically in the studio what what are maybe some uh pieces of advice or in any gems that you got to like help you continue to be who you are like like more maybe maybe more specific or directional to whether it's setup or or, or mm. approach or tuning, mm. you know, okay. maybe 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 more uh, drum, a little okay. bit more drum nerdy. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, again, being a drummer, as you know, and men, and the, those who are on this broadcast will know, you have to be early. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know, you have to arrive with uh, enough time to load in, mm -hmm. unpack, set up, and mm -hmm. then now you're finally ready to actually start seeing what you know what's going on so you know this is really an important part of doing what we do mm -hmm. uh, otherwise you're going to lose you know opportunities mm -hmm. you know pretty quickly mm -hmm. and but not only that it, even if you were able to get you know uh set up and and, and ready to go but you just barely did it mm -hmm. think about that feeling mm -hmm. you know and of course sometimes it's maybe unavoidable yeah you know sometimes but um the thing that leads to confidence is the preparedness. Mm -hmm, I can't mm -hmm. say it enough. Yeah. So if you're there, then you have an opportunity. The engineer, no, maybe no one's even there yet, mm -hmm. and the engineer's like, "Oh, you're all. Right. Mm -hmm. I got all the mics set up. Oh, let's let's uh, mess around for a while." So mm -hmm. I made sure I was early a lot, mm -hmm. so that I could spend time messing around with the engineer and see what the sound. Uh, if I move this symbol over here, what wow. does it sound like? If I put if, if I tune this drum a little bit higher, what does it sound like? Okay, if wow. I tune a little lower, what is it? So I I always made time so that I could have one on one time with the engineers. And uh, I had I had a chance to work with some great engineers. You know, yeah. one of the great ones just passed away here recently, Al yep, Schmidt. Yep. Oh yeah. You know, um but there's so many others, you know, over the course of the, my career that I've worked with um that I I would try to get their in enough time to just yeah. have a one-on-one -on -one with them. So. How did you come up with? Because you know, you know me. I, I've been I've been stalking you for years. How did you come up with the setup of the sonar 10, 12, 14, uh, and then obviously the eighteen fiber skin on the bass drum? Because I know, like for instance, uh, a lot of drummers had the four piece. You know, using two toms. So what was it that 
you know, because I, I think Max probably used that, well, <laughs> but but to what, maybe unpack that a little bit. What influenced me to use the five, the, the two tom? Um, I mean, I always experimented back and forth. Yeah. But you know, you got to remember, I was going to hear Elvin uh, and and Buhana. Yeah. And and Art Blakey and Elvin and 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 Tony too. You know, later on, these guys were you know using the five piece. And I figured, um, and I liked that extra, that one more voice there. Mm. I mean, you know, we can have as many voices as we want. <laughs> right. know, now, nowadays, it's possible. Yeah. But just in the most basic general sense, I, I liked having that one more voice as part of my basic setup, you know, wow. of course, you know. And so it actually in started influ having that extra voice started influencing the things that I played as well as, um, just having an extra voice it also contributed to the types of ideas that would come out just having the other voice right there yeah and, you know? and it's so interesting you say that because i feel as a result your solo which i'm you know going to transition into your your solo language which aside from you being an incredible timekeeper and orchestrator you're this great guy that can take us on a journey with solos i feel like it makes your vocabulary so unique i feel like you know when you listen to a lot of jazz drummers everybody's pulling from the same pool of Philly and Jimmy Cobb and all the other great musicians we mentioned, but I feel like your sound is so unique and your language is different. It's like steeped in the tradition, but it also is different. And I feel like having that other Tom it changes it up because most of us are dealing with, you know, with, with the two Toms. So maybe like, can you talk a little bit about like that, that journey and also soloistically what you're thinking about and obviously i know you have the four symbols and mm -hmm. you know and then you even have some percussion stuff so can you maybe talk to us about that like how that contributes to how you solos or what do you you know students ask me all the time ulysses what do you think about when you solo and i hate talking about solos because i feel like <laughs> we should just talk about timekeeping so yeah. anyway i know i ask you a bunch but That's wherever right. you want to start in that man okay Sorry. so let me let me let me start with the with the soloing thing because you know, as drummers, we have different um, um, kind of pathways we can go down if, as we try to develop a solo. Okay, if you have a solo that's over a form, let's say on a 32 bar song form mm -hmm. or over a blue, 12 bar blues form, then that, that has kind of a built in, you know, there's a built in uh, parameters that you're mm -hmm. working within. When you have an open solo, what, what, when I say open, what do I mean? I mean, you're dictating the, the, the pace of it, mm. whether it's in time, whether it's just sounds, whether it's legato or staccato or, what, or how dense it is. You are using your um, knowledge of form and your ability to move seamlessly between ideas to, mm. to construct within this space an open mm. drum solo. So when you, those are different types of solos. I just wanted to mention those that you mm. can. And so no matter which one, you're calling upon your uh, musical mm, uh, experiences and, and your knowledge of, of uh, how things can, how you can put things together in a logical uh, format mm. to, to say what you have to say. Mm. And so, it really doesn't matter whether there's one tom, two toms, three toms, mm. four toms, five. Really, in the end, it just boils down to your ability to, you know, synchronize these phrases and rhythms mm. in in a manner in which it's uh, it says something. It says mm. what you want to say. Wow! Wow! You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and and so when I would, if if Art Blakey and Elvin and Max, and I, uh, you know, whoever. Uh, Roy Haynes sat down behind the same drum set back to back behind each other and just played, you know, the drums and the drums didn't change tuning at all. You would still hear different, um, different essence <laughs> come through the drums mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. these guys, from these uh, players who have up to this, you know, have developed a, a certain really cl clear mm -hmm. uh, personality and, and, mm -hmm. and voice. So and and we're trying to develop our voice here when we're doing what we're doing. But the the key is being in the moment. I keep coming back to that. Yeah. Because if you if you just involve yourself in the present moment, you just you kind of live with what 
um, with with what the result is in mm -hmm. a more in a wholesome way. Like you don't mm -hmm. worry about your drum solo. You don't worry about what you did on this take or that take. You, mm -hmm. All of your musical sensibilities and abilities have come to play to this point to get you or you wouldn't even be on the record date or mm -hmm. on the concert mm -hmm. or in the band. So mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say to the maybe to the younger guys is you know leave those worries by the yeah. doorstep <laughs> wow <laughs> and just you know be who and where you are at this moment you can't be anything else yeah yeah so yeah, just yeah. so enjoy it yeah there's so too much worry too much analytical yeah. stuff going on you know yeah. the time to do that is in the practice room yeah. and in between stuff and after not while you're doing it yeah. Uh, with with that said, um, which is excellent. With that said, uh, I wanted to throw out a couple of questions. I get a lot of times from young drummers, and I would love to have you as a master answer them. Um, what do you think about when you hear people ask questions about playing time? You know, playing time with bass players, uh, playing time in the rhythm sections. What are some some things to not to overthink, but to consider, or or anything you want young drummers to know from you? Um, okay. Well, there's no one way to do it. Right. And every every bass player um has their way that they interpret the the pulse and the time and so you don't think in terms of okay if i'm playing with an acoustic upright bass player playing jazz this is how i play there is no formula like that mm -hmm. um, but i will say this um there has to be an agreement mm -hmm. between the two on kind of where we're going to place the, the pulse and sometimes that agreement may not necessarily mean that the attack is in the same place from both people all the time. Wow. Wow. Um, the uh, when you think about Elvin Jones playing with Ray Brown, for example, I just that's one that came to mind right mm -hmm. away because people will often think of Elvin as ca having kind of a, a wide laid back kind of feeling and Ray as being very on top and pushing mm -hmm. type of feeling. But when they play together, it works. Yes. And so there's a there's a kind of mm, breathing together that goes on and kind of a awareness of the space between the beats that goes on. Hmm. And even no matter whether the exact attack is 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 uh, is exactly together hmm. at the same time, because very often it's not. Now, we're not talking about a, a constant flam all mm -hmm. the way through just a mm -hmm. general sense of of how the time feels and mm -hmm. so if the if the ride symbol pattern doesn't become too restrictive um in in its execution then you can you can have the kind of feel where it's there's it's a little looser then if you if the two of you talking about bass and drum decide mm -hmm. that you want it to be a, a bit more together and a bit more um uh in sync and specific in mm -hmm. terms of the downbeat you can do that mm -hmm. so so in other words i i i found there to be um um a willingness to let the time breathe yeah. that kind of adds a certain thing sometimes when i was playing with tommy flanagan we may be playing a 32 bar song form and when we get to the bridge the bridge might slow down just a hmm. hair or something you know just a little bit you pull back and you don't you don't have to say well this is where it was counted off right no, right right here. because those 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 kind of things are very subtle it's not the kind of thing that you would it would be obvious and it would be oh and the whole audience would think oh it's slowed down now at the bridge mm. it's not that kind of thing it's a very subtle kind of thing it just gives some some space and a little breath to to what's going on you know does that make sense yeah it makes a lot of sense um i have a couple more questions to ask before i open up and um, take some questions from the audience. You know, for over 400 records, um, Nash, that you've been on and, and you know, all over the world, what's, other than the preparedness and, and all the things you mentioned, what is something you hold on to through every record? Or what is something that you could say has been streamlined or, or been consistent through those 400 plus records? Um, you know, other than just your perspective, is there anything that comes to mind? Because obviously you continue to grow as a player, but anything that you can say, you know, throughout all of these different experiences, I hold on to these other things, be it musical or non-musical. Hmm. You know, I, I suppose we hold on to things, but, uh, you know, Ulysses, the older I get, <laughs> the, I'm, I'm trying to hold on to less. 
And I'm, I'm actually, wow. I'm, I'm actually, wow. I actually, um, I realize how much I don't know, you know. Wow. And and so, I I understand your question, but I just want people to think a, about a certain thing, you know. And even as a teacher, one thing I've come to realize is, um, it's okay to not know everything, <laughs> because you only you only need to know what you need to know to do what you need to do. And you don't have to need to know stuff that requires you to do something that you're not going to do. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and so I don't I don't mean to I'm not avoiding your question because yeah, yeah. because I just think that we, we hold on to too much. I agree. We're, we're, we're too we become too um you know um predictable and too set in a mold and too inflexible sometimes mm -hmm. and so at the at the at the risk of uh uh um taking your question in a direction you didn't want it to go <laughs> that's okay I'll, i'm I'll open just... <laughs> i'm open i'm letting go <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah wow so so then with that said nash what is the state of jazz drumming today what is your vantage point on on what it is to be a jazz drummer in 2021 um and and without giving any prescriptions uh, what do you, you know, what do you want to share with us? Those of us that are drummers, those of us that obviously love drumming, those that are, you know, wanting to know about the drummer's perspective. What are you thinking about jazz drumming June 16, 2021? Just have a wide palette, you know, be, be, um, secure in your knowledge of where the music comes from and where, where this drumming, the way we drum, mm -hmm. where it's rooted, who the great players that we've mentioned many of them in this interview um know what it means what it feels like to to swing to mm -hmm. know what it feels like to play the, all the different grooves that we play the afro-cuban sixes and the and the bosses and the and the caribbean rhythms and all the things that modern players kind of have to have in their in their toolbox mm -hmm. all, you have to know all of that stuff sure mm -hmm. but at the same time um be open to just uh what rhythm what does rhythm do in this context that i find myself in wow. you, you know if you if you think too much about too genre specific um and and you have to of course if you're playing a, a, a walk a, a straight ahead four four swinging tune there are there's certain things about the genre about that style of playing you have to think about i know that but what i'm saying is even within that try to be try to make yourself as open to any possibility everything's on the table something that comes from 1930 something that comes from the way drumming was in 1940 something that comes from the way drumming is right now something that comes from the 70s just you know be open to all the possibilities that the instrument has to offer and it, in that way something that you might not have considered it might occur to you in the moment while you're in the studio or you're on a gig hey this such and such thing can work mm -hmm. right here i hear it it's not it doesn't go with that normally but i hear it right here yeah, and you do it yeah. and you're daring you wow. know so that way you don't get locked into only doing things a certain way man i love it um i have a few questions from some of uh, the audience members uh sly randolph asked um could you could you explain excuse me your approach to playing with steve wilson on duologue mm. I approach that pretty much the same way way I approach playing all the time, and that there's a few differences though because it's just saxophone and drums. But the way I'm playing when I play duo with Steve is is basically the way I play with a quartet, with a trio, with a big band. I'm I'm thinking of the things I can do to to uh, shape the music and orchestrate and do those things. I'm thinking of all of of uh, our time relationship how steve is hearing and feeling the time and how i am um i'm thinking of the whatever we're playing whether it's a song or if it's an open free improvisation whatever the case may be whatever those parameters are am i am i operating within there in a way that's musical and 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 uh, in the moment and relating to what steve is doing hmm. um those are some of the things that i think of right away no, oh, beautiful. Um, yeah. Ant Anthony Huggins asked, uh, when you spoke about open solos, you mentioned in an interview once that Freddie Waits helped you in your open solos. Could you share some of what? Yeah. What he did was he he 
he played a drum solo when I during that time when I first met him when he was here with Billy Taylor, um, which he he called it. Um, he titled the solo for those who have gone before. Mm. <laughs> and it was kind of a, uh, in a soloistic way, he captured the history of the drum set and the development of it. And he didn't even, you know, Freddie would call the, he wanted to call, he had a name for the drum set. He called the MPI, multiple, multiple percussion <laughs> instrument. <laughs> wow, I love that. Yeah, the uh, multiple percussion instrument, which it, which really actually is, an accurate description of what when you say the drum set and you say mm -hmm. the multiple percussion instrument you know it actually makes sense why he liked that terminology wow. so occasionally i'll say mpi now <laughs> just in honor of freddie um, i love that so yeah he he uh that was based on that one time that first time i heard him do a drum solo an open drum solo where i could hear baby dodds mm -hmm. i could hear you know joe jones i could hear max I could hear maybe later on some of the stuff that might be considered, you know, Tony and Elvin related. And so um, that that's what I was referring to. Wow. I love yeah. that. Mm -hmm. um, Juan Diaz asked, what do you think about the hip hop influence on jazz or vice versa? And and I and to sort of add to that, um, I feel like a lot of the modern jazz drummers today, a lot of them have more of the hip hop influence in their playing. Uh, and maybe less of them are really incorporating swing. So what do you maybe think about that as well? Or what are your feelings about that? Um, yeah, just yeah. In, in, well, I think, commentary. I think, um, I'm, I'm, first of all, every younger generation has their music that they're into and that mm. they're kind of gravitate toward, right? So there's, a, there's a, a process that happens over time where the elements that actually can be absorbed by a, a jazz situation are, are absorbed. It takes time, though, to see, OK, this works, this doesn't work, this works, this doesn't work. And so um, I think all of the popular musics, things which appeal to a large group of folks, um, more so than like a, a straight ahead jazz situation, there's only certain things from that, certain aspects from that, uh, the the appeal of that, that the aspects that appeal to the larger group of people. Um, there's only certain aspects from that that you can take and then put into what we do. Mm. Um, some of those rhythm, hip hop rhythms have a have a go go ish, you know, triplety mm. kind of vibe to them. Some of them are more straight up and down, straight eight. Um, and I I think it's um, I'm all for the young people experimenting and finding all different ways to utilize uh, the music that came before and what's happening now. My my um, uh, hope is that they spend enough time really understanding what what the rhythmic feels that came before actually feel feel like you know you know immerse yourself in them and and actually try to play that way so that you can physically feel like feel what it feels like to play a medium or really slow swing pattern. If you haven't actually done it, then you're not going to, it's not going to be in your body. Mm. So I spent, you know, again, I came late to jazz. I spent, I, I spent a lot of time playing, you know, trying to play like Clyde Stubblefield and, and, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and Jabbo Starks and trying to play like a uh, Zigaboo and trying to play like the guys playing R&B and funk. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how much of it, when I play straight ahead jazz, um, I didn't just forget about all that and I didn't erase that influence from my playing. It's there. I can't say exactly how it manifests when I'm swinging, <laughs> but those were the guys who got me to play the drums in the first place. So how could it be gone? <laughs> you know, wow. so maybe the only thing that I'm probably, this is my personal thing. So, and I don't know what people out there will think. Sometimes the rhythms that are associated with the hip hop thing are so, uh, computer sounding or so uh um they, i don't know how to put it the, the the way the rhythms are are subdivided it's a very straight up and down thing and it doesn't have the the loop the the what what i call the the um i don't know that kind of cycling circular mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. that swing that swing has yeah and um so i'm 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 less those mechanistic sounding straight up and down mm -hmm. grooves i'm less inclined to like myself but that's just me personally 
No, I dig it. Um, <laughs> before before I let you go, you know, and just obviously appreciating you for everything you've given to me and, and to so many other drummers. I see Clarence Penn, who dropped in, um, and, and so many others that I know we all look to you um, as a guide. What, what, do you, what do you have going on now, or, or, or what do you want to share with us that's coming up for you or, you know, in anything um, that, that you're excited about right now? Okay. Well, what I'm excited about now is getting back to playing music like everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, I've been I, I've utilized the 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 pandemic's uh, situation to do a lot of, you know, like everyone else, soul searching and, and kind of um, contemplating what we would like to do once we come out of this. And, um, you know, I, st I still have a, a, a working group that, you know, of course, we haven't worked in a while, but the quintet still exists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's with uh, Jeremy Pelt, Jimmy Green, Rini Ross, and Peter Washington. And I look forward to, you know, but that's been many years we've been doing that. And and those musicians are doing a lot of other things well, or have to. We have to now. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking forward to uh, collaborating with, with, with other musicians now that things are opening up and uh, um, starting to travel again. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking forward to hearing who's on the scene now, because mm -hmm. I, you know, there were possibilities to hear what the younger and, and uh, up and coming musicians were doing during the pandemic. But I, as I said, I was kind of inwardly focused, but now I'm ready to kind of hear, okay, more about mm -hmm. more of what's going on out there. It's what some of the younger groups are doing, how they're combining, you know, the music that they're into, that the younger folks are into with with the things that have come before. Mm -hmm. um, the Nash is going well, is going strong here in, okay. in Phoenix. That's the club here that's that's named in my honor. And wow. it's it just opened up again uh, last weekend mm -hmm. uh, since it closed down for the pandemic. Um, I'm teaching it here at Arizona State University mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're looking forward to getting back to in-person mm -hmm. uh, experiences in the fall. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking forward to that. The very next thing on my agenda probably is uh, uh, um, the Vale Jazz nice. uh, Workshop and Festival, which many of you out there are probably familiar with. Um, high school age, uh, high school musicians are, come to Vale, Colorado for a week. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of that week is the Vale Jazz Festival when mm -hmm. professional groups come play. So that's at the end of August going into Labor Day weekend into mm -hmm. September. So those are the more more immediate things right now. But I, you know, I have a lot of irons in the fire for yeah. 2022, yeah. things that I'd like to do. I'm singing more. I'm going to yeah. sing a lot more coming up. I'm not going to put the drumsticks down, though. Please but. don't. Please. <laughs> we, 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 I still no. got, our, we got, we got our notepads out. We, we, we got more, <laughs> we got more stuff to, uh, to learn from you, you yeah. know? So, yeah. no, I appreciate you. You know, I wanted to show you this thing, man. I don't know if you remember, uh, if I put it in the camera, this is you and me back at oh Juilliard. My God. <laughs> <laughs> See, oh my goodness what was that occasion that, man that was the first concert nash oh my and, god and i think it was uh i felt like it was october of uh 2001 um when you know i came to new york to right. work with you but man i just want to thank you i know your time is incredibly precious but i want to thank you so much for just answering the call and and being part of this i i had to start this series with you because as i tell everybody you are literally the reason why i moved to new york and why i want to be any of what i'm still pursuing on the drums and jazz you are that guy for me so well, you, you're doing a you. great job ulysses thank you very much for for having me on the thank series you. you have lined up is great i think you have hurl and riley coming up and yeah. you have you know, I don't. Who's who's after that? After so Herlin? I got uh, Herlin coming up, and then I got Eric Harland, mm -hmm. and then uh, next month we've got uh, uh we've got Nate Smith coming on. We got right. Nasheet. Nasheet's Good. gonna be coming. Terry yeah. Lynn. So we now, we're now gonna look, try to Nasheet, line them up. Nasheet was a little toddler when I was really? playing with his father. <laughs> oh, wow! <laughs> and wow. he would come in, and, and uh, Freddie would say, Go, "Get out of here, Nasheet! I'm teaching the drum lesson." Oh man, Daddy, Daddy! <laughs> <laughs> wow. Anyway, well, well, man, thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna stay on. Uh, with the audience, but I just want to say thank you again from the bottom of my heart. My so, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, man. Take uh, care. Bye bye. Thank you. Um, so for those that are still here, I want to thank you for checking out the first episode of uh, the drummer's perspective. I'm going to actually end in a second with um, a drum solo. 
uh, that I'm gonna I'm gonna attempt to play in tribute to my my dear friend Lewis Nash. Um, I just want to just kind of recount some of the great things that Nash talked about. I, I want to thank um, Juan because uh, or excuse me Richie. I think he put in there what leads to confidence is preparedness, and uh, and that is so I- I- incredible. I also want you all to check out you know as many nash records as you can um google him he's on so many wonderful recordings and also i think it's important to like he said play along with records uh for those drummers and even non-drummers out there don't put too much on yourself right you know we're living in the information information age where we're often saying you know how can we be you know a better musician and we're going on the bandstand with so many thoughts in our head so i just want to echo those sentiments that uh mr nash gave us which is you know let the music come to you obviously be prepared study but just be in the present moment be in the now moment so uh i want to also thank uh some of the great uh artists that have popped in and uh yeah we're gonna be here next week we're gonna have herlin riley joining us uh and he's was was another one i was fortunate going to juilliard to have uh, probably five incredible teachers one was mr nash the other was carl allen then i had billy drummond herlin riley and i also took some lessons with kenny washington so these drummers have been uh very integral to to what i am continuing to seek to evolve into so uh thank you i see you john lumpkin thanks so much brian uh isabella what's up from dubai or or as you're in dubai i'm in florida and uh yeah thank you to open studio network so i'm going to transition to to the drum set and uh i probably won't you may not be able to hear me say goodbye on that microphone because I can only use a couple inputs. But thank you so much for checking us out. And we are literally starting today and we're going to go for many months. And I got a lot of great uh, guests. And I just wanted to say as well, if you are out there and you have uh, a suggestion of some guests that you'd love for me to consider for the drummer's perspective, uh, be it wonderful drummers and educators out there or even other musicians that you would love to for me to think about, uh, please throw them in the chat or even send an email to Open Studio Network. So thank you so much, and I'm gonna transition to the drum set. So. All righty. So uh, I'm just gonna think about Lewis Nash, and uh, we'll see what comes out. I, I'm 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 nervous because I, I hope he's not watching still. But I'm gonna I'm gonna think about him as I seek to play some stuff. <laughs>
Thank you all so much. Take care.